To say that God does not exist, you have to have absolute knowledge of everything. In order to state absolutely that God is nowhere in the universe. Now that might be hard to get your mind around when you hear that right now, but just think about this. If you say God does not exist, then you have to be able to visit every planet and say, nope, God is not here. You have to go to every galaxy and search for him in every atom and know that God is not in that galaxy. And then all the galaxies, and throughout the whole universe, you have to have absolute knowledge to know God is nowhere. But to know God exists, all you have to do is meet Him. And so, I met the Lord when I was 15. He spoke very clearly to me. And my whole life was transformed because of this encounter with the living God. And so I can truly share with you today, He is real. But one of the problems that oftentimes people bring up is that if God is real, why, does, why doesn't He just show up? Why doesn't He come down here right now and show me His face? Well, let me put it this way. The God that created our Son with a word which we can't even look at the sun for more than a few seconds without being overcome and our eyes hurting. And you can stare at it for a little longer and maybe they'll start dripping and maybe you'll go blind. If he spoke that one sun, but also billions of stars into existence with a word, how should we expect to stand in the presence of of this unapproachable, all-powerful, amazing God. In order to experience Him, He has to speak to us in ways that are safe for us. In ways that we can understand because He's so far above and so powerful. And so that's what we're looking at today. Five ways God speaks. And there are more, but these are the five I'm focusing on. And number one we find in Acts 17, verse 26 to 28. He speaks through my life. He speaks through my life. And it says this, And He made one from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He is actually not far from each one of us. In Him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. God speaks through our life for the purpose that we might reach out for Him and find Him and this verse tells us He is close by. Now in this verse, in Acts chapter 17, Paul went to the Athenians to share the Gospel with these philosophers. When he got there, he noticed Athens was filled with altars to all these different gods. And among those altars was one that said to the unknown God, and so he said, let me tell you about the God you don't know. I know Him. He's creator of heaven and earth. He created you. And so you see, that there was something put into their life that spoke of the existence of God that was personal. That was close to them. Now a few years ago, when I used to have an office here on campus, it was broken into. Somebody pried the door open and got into the office and and stole uh, a computer, um, and also got into my office, opened the safe, pulled out the money thing, and uh, uh, lifted up the cash drawer and put it down, and looked inside, didn't find any money, which was the funny thing was there was a huge pile of cash that was covered by one receipt, and they didn't see it. We were like, hey, well, at least they didn't get that. But we called the sheriff, 
they came down and they took fingerprints off the desk and checked it out. Now, you know that somebody was there because there's evidence, there's fingerprints, and there's also not just the, the, the proof of his presence, but also the identity of the person. God has left fingerprints on your life. It says the exact place that we would be born in the exact time that we would exist. Everything in your life has been orchestrated to point to God. And He did that so that we would reach out for Him. Now, it's not that we would understand necessarily from those things the Gospel but we know that he's there, and we know that he's personal, and we know that he's close. Now, I came to Christ when I was 15. I used to laugh at my friends that had to go to church because, you know, they had to do confirmation or whatever it was, and, and I'd say, oh man, I get to sleep in, and you got to go to that boring church stuff. That must really stink, you know? Um, but then... I started going to Young Life, heard about Christ at camp, gave my life to Jesus, and then I was going to church every Sunday. Everything changed for me. People at my school all heard that I had come to Christ. Some, of, some people thought I was in a cult because I had changed overnight. So many things in my life turned around and, and I started living for Jesus rather than for myself. And it was evident. About a year later, I was sitting in class, and as oftentimes, somebody from the office comes in with a note. And you know what it's like when you're in that place. Everybody's wondering, is it for me? And as the note was handed off to the teacher, the teacher starts walking down my aisle. And I'm like, okay, it's coming closer. And then she looks at me and puts it on my desk. And it's that moment you're going, oh man, what is this about? So I looked at it and said, go to the counselor's office. This isn't good. Uh, I go to the counselor's office and they said, hey, I want you to come into my office. And I went in there and there was a girl that I'd known for some years. And the counselor said, she asked to talk to you since you're one of the natural helpers. It's a group of kids that would help other kids out. Um, I want you to talk to her, and then he walked out, shut the door. And I'm sitting in there with this girl in the counselor's office, and she said, you know, I wanted to talk to you because I, this last week, was drunk and was raped by six guys at a party. And, of course, my natural inclination was to try to find out who they were so I could wring their necks or do a little bit more than that. And... She said, no, 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 I don't want you to know who they are. I don't want you to do anything about this. All I want to know is I know you have something I want. I know that you're a Christian. And I can see the joy in you, and I want what you have. And so I proceeded to share Christ, and we prayed in that counselor's office, and this girl's life was transformed. You know, she was filled with joy. I remember, uh, must have been within the next month, she was yelling across the school, Jesus loves you, to the whole school. You know, I don't believe that God did that to her, but I believe the fingerprints was that God put my life in her path so that she could see that there is a God who cares and transforms lives, and that's what she did. She reached out. And she found it. There are things that God has done in your life to speak to you. He's near to you. And He desires for you to reach out and find Him. And for all of us, it's a different story. For the Athenians, it was the idol to the unknown God. Um, For you, you know what that is. And it's been maybe gnawing at you. Hanging there in your mind and in your heart, causing that big question mark. So reach out for him and find him. He's there. But secondly, God speaks to us through creation. 
God speaks to us through creation. Number two. In Psalm 19, 1 through 4, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. It's summertime, and maybe you like to sleep outside, or you like to stargaze. It's a great time to ponder um, the vastness of the universe when you lay down. I, I used to love to sleep outside when I was younger. As many nights as I could possibly do that, we'd throw a blanket out in the backyard and, and lay out there and, and look at the stars and, and try to see meteors and, and whatnot. But I love to sit there and think about how amazing things were. Scriptures tell us that the stars declare His glory. And they're constantly pouring out speech that God is real. And through His creation, we can enjoy and hear that testimony. We see God in the cosmos and in nature. From the largest scale to the smallest, God is throughout it all. Now, our solar system, if you were to look at how long it takes for you to ride a beam of light from the sun to the earth, anybody know how long that takes? Eight minutes. Somebody that was at camp. Actually, you you knew that at camp, too. Little scientist. (laughs) That's good. Eight minutes if you were to ride a a, a light beam from the sun to the earth. Now, if you were to ride a light beam from our sun to the nearest star, out of all the billions of stars, the the nearest star, it would take 4.24 light years. If you were to go from where we're at in our galaxy to just the edge of our galaxy, it it would take on a beam of light 25,000 years across our galaxy, 100,000 years. Our galaxy is huge, but that's just one of millions of galaxies in our universe. The universe is so huge and so vast, but it all speaks of God's transcendence, His omnipotence, His power, but also to the smallest scale going down to the cell and all the mechanisms within the cell. I mean, the cell itself is like this world filled with different reactions and chemicals and mitochondria and all these different things that are going on inside the cell, including DNA. Which is interesting because in creation you have various types of order. Sand on the seashore is random order. It's kind of spread out everywhere. A crystal is what's called repeating order, where the molecules repeat again and again and again and again in the same fashion, pretty orderly. But what we find in DNA is what we would call specific order. It's order with purpose. It's order with a language. DNA actually contains three-dimensional instructions on how to build you. That's phenomenal. We don't have that kind of technology. And whenever you hear people talking about uh, changing DNA and stuff, we take what is already there and we we change the code to get a certain outcome. And, And the assumption is that that code has a purpose, a design, an intelligence to it. And so we see, even in our molecules, intelligence in the order of things. For over 50 years, Anthony Flew was one of the most noted atheists in the world. In 2004, he publicly announced that he was no longer an atheist, that he had to come to grips with his statement that he's made so many times over the years, that he would truly follow the evidence wherever it led him. 
for 50 years, leading people to believe there is no God, but following the evidence, he came to the belief that there is a God because of design. Another man, Francis Collins, who was in charge of the Human Genome Project, studying DNA, mapping out our DNA. Um, He also served as the director of the National Institute of Health. In 2007, he wrote this New York Times best-selling book called The Language of God, which before he studied these things, he he discounted God, believed there was no God, but through this scientific endeavor, it spoke of the existence of God. Once he came to the point where he conceded that there has to be intelligence behind our DNA sequence, he was in a medical office meeting with a patient who asked him what he believed. And he uh, stammered. He didn't know what quite to say. He didn't have an answer for this this patient, and he, he got embarrassed. His face actually turned red, he said. And being a doctor, feeling like he should have an answer. So he started looking more into, okay, who is this guy? He was hiking in the Cascade Mountains when he came across this frozen waterfall hundreds of feet high and in that moment was amazed and realized that this Jesus that he had heard about must be real. The next morning, he woke up, knelt down in the dewy grass outside of his tent, and surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. These are well-known philosophers, well-known scientists who study creation and come to the knowledge that there is a God. Why? Because God speaks through creation. And that voice has been going out since the beginning. That creation is beautiful. It's powerful, it's good, it's intricate, and in it we see a God who loves us so much in the care that he takes in every little detail, in every huge detail as well. So we have this great creator who is good, but he's also loving. Psalm 139 Verse 13 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I cannot even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand, and when I wake, you are still with me. That's the kind of creator we have, not far off and distant, but close up and personal. He thinks about you so much they outnumber the grains of sand of the seashore. His thoughts are so many about you. I love the way the psalmist sees this as that he wakes up after not having thought about God for eight hours while he was sleeping. He wakes up and he says, you are still with me. Reminds me of when my kids were little And I would be asleep in bed, and I would get this sense that there is a presence really close to my face. You know what I'm talking about, parents? And you open your eyes, and boom, there's the face. Daddy. You know? Not until you open your eyes, of course, but after you open your eyes. Dad. Yeah? (laughs) You're lucky I didn't punch or anything, you know? Um, But God's like that. You wake up, boom. He's been there, watching you breathe, dream, sleep, thinking about you constantly. 
It's nice to know that somebody thinks about us more than we think about ourselves, right? God speaks to us through creation. He also speaks to us in a more specific way that has a message to it. Not just that He's there, but has a message. And that's through His Word. God speaks to us, number three, through His Word. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God. When I was 12 years old, believe it or not, that is when I first met my wife, Marianne. She lived across the street from my cousin. And we went skating, and then we went to the same junior high, and we went to the same high school, we went to the same college, and two years into college we started dating. But um, when we started dating, we were both followers of Jesus Christ, we put God as the center of our relationship and honored Him and, and you know, wanted to make sure everything we did was something God would want us to do. So that if this relationship didn't work out, we would leave each other better off. Not worse off, with damage, but better off. And so we honored the Lord. Ten months later, we were engaged. Or eight months later, we were engaged. Ten months later, we were married. But during the time that I went away to Bible college, when we were dating, and for the t- some of the time we were engaged, uh, Marianne used to write me letters. This is before Al Gore invented the internet, apparently, because <laughs> we would have wrote emails or something. Uh, but she would write me letters, and I'd get these flowery envelopes in the mail, and they were thick, you know, multiple pages. So I would go to my student box and pull out the letter and kind of hide it. Who wants to be seen carrying a flowery letter across campus, you know? Take it back to my dorm room, pull it out, open it up, and there's all the letters, or all the pages that she would write me. And in, in those pages was sprayed perfume, like on every page. So it made just just sick, going, oh, man, I miss... Marianne. But on those pages were personal information uh, about what, how her day was going, uh, how the week had gone, and how much she missed me, all that mushy stuff. And that's what the Bible is like from God. He sends us a letter that is personal, and it has information in it about who he is, about how he works and about how we could know Him. But it's more than just a letter. As this verse says, the Word of God is living and active. Most books we read, we have a passive relationship with the book. It doesn't do anything unless you're reading it. Um, And then your imagination has to make, you know, the scenes and whatnot, right? Um, and books are fun. I love reading uh, political action thr- thrillers and stuff like that. And you get into the characters, the heroes. And, um, but once the book is done, then you're kind of depressed. It was a great book. I can't wait till he writes another one in a year from now. Uh, i got to wait. Um, put it back on the shelf, and that's it. The Bible, God is the main character. And you are one of the characters that are brought into it. It's not passive. When you read the Word, it's alive and active. So it actually does the work on you. It interacts with who you are. It's a living story. And every time you read that book, or that chapter, or that portion of Scripture... It's always speaking in a very personal way. God touches you in ways that are different every time. I mean, I read the same passages at different points in my life and receive, although it says the same truth, it speaks to me 
in a very personal way in terms of application and encouragement based on where I'm at right now. It's active on you and in your life. And it's alive. It never gets boring. never gets dull. But another thing the Word does, as it says here, it discerns. The Word of God discerns. Or the NIV says judges. So you read the Bible, and it's kind of like a good friend. When you've gone out to lunch, and you've had that salad, and you've got that big old green piece of spinach that's over one of your teeth, right? And you smile, and you can't figure out why people, like, look away. What's wrong? You know? Uh, nope, no, nothing there. Uh, what's going on? And, and so, But a good friend will say, hey, you know what? You got some spinach right there. They'll let you know about it. Somebody who's not as good of a friend, they'll let you look like an idiot. And they'll let you actually leave the restaurant looking that way. (laughs) The Bible is like that. It points things out in our lives that are off, that aren't right. Don't take offense to it. You know, if my friend tells me I have spinach in my teeth, I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, i got to get that out before somebody else sees me. The Word of God is like that. It will point things out that are wrong. And one of the things that it does, you don't have to read the Bible very long to see that it lets us know that we have a major problem. It's more akin to having a doctor tell you that you have cancer. Because this problem is called sin. We read about it in the first couple pages of the Bible. Adam and Eve. They're in the garden. They're given one command. Only one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or else you will die. Or literally in the Bible it says, dying you will die. Now, it didn't take long. With just one command, don't do this, before Eve was in front of that tree and the serpent was tempting her to partake. It looks so good. It's actually pleasing to look at. It's desirable. You really want this if you want to be wise. God's holding out on you by not letting you have this wisdom. He's like a potty poopa, as Arnold Schwarzenegger says. It would be good to eat and taste it and have it fill your bellies. But God doesn't want you to have that enjoyment either. And so Eve took the the, the fruit. She partook and gave it to Adam and he partook. First thing they felt was shame. Imagine that. Never having had shame in your whole life. And then all of a sudden, overwhelming, crushing shame. And then they realize they're naked. And then they hide. And God comes walking, as He often did, to spend time with His people. The garden was like a sanctuary where you could talk with God and walk with God and be with God the way He created us to be. And yet, here for the first time, they're ashamed and they're trying to hide from God. Now there's something that separates them. Now some things happen. The curse is talked about. But God ends up driving out Adam and Eve from the garden, from this perfect place, from this sanctuary of His presence, He kicks them out. In Isaiah 53, verse... I'm sorry, in Genesis 3.24, it says, He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They were removed from God's presence and barred from tree of life which would allow them to live forever notice that cherubim this amazing angel was put there to guard the entrance you cannot go in and if you try that sword's going to chop you up you're going to die now this was not because God was bad 
or mean that he did such a thing, but it's because God is so good. To let sinful people eat of the tree of life and live forever in that state, horrible. But rather, that was an act of mercy, but also it was an act of judgment. Because God is totally pure and holy. I have an illustration for you that I used at camp, and I just want to share with you. God, pure and holy. You can drink him. It's good stuff. Now, he created us to have a relationship with him. So here's Adam in the garden before sin, and they have this relationship where they can fellowship and say, hey, God, the day's going pretty good. Like in this fruit here in this garden. It's organic. And then he can worship the Lord and have this conversation, fellowship. It's great. That's the way God created us to be, but then comes sin. And sin enters into our life. I've never had to try so hard to sin before. I mean, okay, there we go. And there is sin. We'll put it between them. There we go. And now, Adam cannot fellowship with God because of sin. And that's the state that the Word tells us we're in. We're born in this state. Because you see, Adam passed on his sin to the world. And that's us today. Sin happens in our heart when we first say God, you're great and all, but I want to do my own thing. And so we go the other direction. That's sin. Oftentimes we like to put tags on it, you know, cussing, premarital sex, or, you know, whatever it may be. But sin begins when we turn the other direction and walk away from the Lord, live a life apart from Him. Isaiah 53, 6 says this, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all like sheep have gone astray. That's a simple illustration. You know, God puts it in words we can understand. He's the shepherd, and he longs for his sheep. But his sheep have gone away from him. The consequence is death. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. So the Word of God reveals so much about who God is, how He works, who we are, but it reveals that we're sinners. But the fourth way God speaks to us is this. God is real, and he speaks to me through Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. All things were created through him, by the way. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace And true. And so God becomes a man that he might take care of this problem called sin. And so Jesus comes to this earth, into this world. Jesus is pure and he's holy. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in every way like we are, yet was pure and without sin. The 
you might think that God can't relate with you. But that's just simply not true. When he came to this earth, he was born just as we are. He lived on this earth just as you have. He, was, he had parents that told him what to do. He had to sleep. He had to eat. He had to eat his vegetables. Went through puberty. Probably had his voice crack and had pimples and everything, just like you guys. He's been tempted, just like you, and yet was without sin. God knows you and can relate with you because he's walked where you walk. Now, Jesus came to this earth for a purpose, and that was to reconcile us to God, bring us back into a relationship with God where we can then experience life again. He was arrested, although he didn't do anything wrong. He was put on trial and accused of things and sentenced to die the death of crucifixion. Which, just by the way, just so you know, is the most shameful death in that day. So the shame that Adam and Eve brought upon themselves is now being transferred to Jesus who is going to be executed by the most shameful death in the Roman world. So shameful that a Roman citizen would not be allowed to be crucified. That was their right to not be lowered to that point. Jesus, as he was crucified and hung on that cross, we're told that it turned dark for three hours. Which was, to people in that day who understood how eclipses worked, it was baffling to them. We have Roman historians and Jewish historians that wrote about that day and that, that darkness that happened and they had no explanation for it. They even mentioned that it was during the Passover full moon. Which for a lunar eclipse to happen, if this is the sun and here's the earth, the moon comes in between the sun and the earth. But for a full moon to happen, the moon is on the other side, and so it has full light, and that's what we see from the earth. It was time of the, the, the full moon. Historians and scientists and, and people in that day were baffled where this darkness come from, but I venture to guess that this darkness was the sin of all mankind coming upon Christ while he hung on the cross. It was a dark hour. When your sin, past, present, and future, Jesus received upon himself and died for. As he hung on that cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all history, the Son was alone because of our sin. He was absolutely alone so that you would never have to be alone. When He died, He took your sin upon Himself and paid the price that we might live. He hung on that cross and he received our sin and paid for it. Yet, we know that he died and three days later he rose again. He's the only one that could do such a thing. The ultimate sacrifice and a perfect and pure holy sacrifice. And now for anyone that would receive him he gives the right to become children of God so that He can wash us clean. It's that receiving of Christ, the ultimate revelation. God Himself came to us that brings us life. Now that access that was once 
blocked by that cherubim and flaming sword was opened at the moment Christ died. If you remember, there was a great earthquake. In that moment, the curtain of the temple, which separated the holy place from the most holy place, which represented God's throne. There was this huge curtain, 30 feet high, 30 feet wide, 18 inches thick. And guess what was on that curtain? Cherubim. Remind you of that boundary that God put up? We're told that during that earthquake, it ripped from top to bottom. Can you imagine the horror of those priests as they saw this veil torn? And they thought, oh no, we're going to die. Jesus opened the way that we might enter in. If we receive Him, He washes away our sin and we can enter into the presence of God once again and partake, as we see in Revelation, of that tree of life that is to come. For those who enter in by faith, God speaks a fifth way, and that is through His Spirit. Now the Spirit speaks when you understand Christ died for you. He, he has to show you those things. But He continues to speak to you as you follow Him. It says in John 14, 16 through 17, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. It seems these days, whenever we go to a new place, a hotel, a friend's house, a coffee shop, even the school here, the first thing we do is pull out our phone and we look for something. Anybody know what it is? Wi-Fi. We're looking for Wi-Fi. Everywhere we go, we, we we're looking for Wi-Fi. We want connection. And so, I know at my, at my house, there's like 10 Wi-Fi signals that pop up when I open my computer. Only one of them's ours. And I'm still not sure who Fartmaster is, but, uh, you know, that's <laughs> one of them. <laughs> you have all these different things that pop up. And in order to get on the Wi-Fi, there's the second question. Not only is there Wi-Fi, but what's the password? The Holy Spirit is better than Wi-Fi. He is everywhere all the time and therefore connecting. He lives in us. He speaks to us. We have this flow of information from God that's available, but you need the password. And that password is a name. And that name is Jesus. When you enter that password, you have access, full access. There's a lot of other signals out there. And a lot of them don't have passwords. And they'll let you in because there's hackers. Maybe they'll install malware. It will take over your computer or phone and steal information. But there's only one signal that's God, the Holy Spirit. And so every day we log in. Every day we connect and stay connected. Now, the Spirit does a lot of things in our life. Many of us use Google. If you need information, Google it. Now it became a verb in our language, actually. People use it so much. You need information? Ask. Seek. Knock. And God says, I will give it to you. Everything we need to know. The, the Spirit produces in us fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He encourages us. He comforts us. He helps us. You're not on your own when you accept Christ. He reveals more of Jesus to us. If you're reading the Bible, the Spirit illuminates the Scriptures so that you could see. Before I was a Christian, I tried reading the Bible, and it was really weird and hard. After I became a Christian, I didn't know really anything, but when I started reading the Bible, it started hitting me in the head and the heart. And I would go to my friends that weren't Christians, and I'm like, you'll never guess what I read in the Bible today. This is so cool, listen to this. And I'd share it with them, and they're like, what? That's weird. And I'd be like, this is amazing. It's so cool. God speaks. But he also meets us in prayer. We can pray anywhere, anytime. We don't need a temple and we don't need a priest. Because here's the thing. When you accept Christ, your heart is now the temple. And he indwells you. And everywhere you go, you have that connection. And so prayer is part of one of the great things that the Holy Spirit helps us with, actually. Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. You go to pray, and you've got somebody praying alongside of you, the Holy Spirit. You might be off in your prayer, but the Holy Spirit is always on. Father, forgive him for asking for that Lamborghini. Please give him a Pinto. Or a <laughs> or a Segway. God answers prayer. And it's amazing. George Mueller, the English evangelist, established orphanage, orphanages in England during the 1800s. And during that time, one morning he got up, all the children came down for breakfast and were sitting at the tables, and George Mueller knew they didn't have any food, they didn't have any money left in their bank account, and yet he prayed, Father... Thank you for the food that we're about to receive. Now that's faith, right? How many of you guys would try that with your kids at home? I mean, wow. Now, as soon as he prayed and said amen, there was a knock at the door. And it was the local baker. He said, you know, I couldn't sleep last night. I I really sensed that you guys needed food this morning. And so I woke up and went and, and, and got up the manager of the bakery at 2 in the morning and asked him to make enough bread for you for this morning. And so his manager was a little irritated and said, you woke me up at 2 in the morning for that? He said, on second thought, why don't you make him enough for a week? And he started to walk away and he's like, no, 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 i got to sleep. Make him enough for a month. Then he went back home and slept soundly. Until the morning, he went and got the bread and he brought it to the orphanage that morning. There was another knock at the door. And it was a milkman. He said, you'll never guess what happened. I was driving by in my cart full of milk and the wheels fell off. Right in front of your orphanage. This milk is going to go bad. Uh, I don't have enough time to repair the, the cart, so please take it all. You know, God provides, and he answers prayer, and for George Mueller and these orphans that he served for 63 years, they never went without food. And the longest they ever had to wait was 30 minutes. Do you truly believe that the Spirit is real and speaks to you and prays with you? Man. To have faith like George Mueller. But God is real. 
and He speaks in so many ways. Do you hear His voice this morning? I'm going to take a moment to respond to His voice. Why don't we bow our heads? If you know that God is real and you have not yet received Christ into your life, Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank You for coming to this earth, for dying on the cross for my sin. I receive You into my life. The payment that You you paid to take away my shame. Thank You for rising also from the dead and opening the way that I might be with You forever. Help me to follow You, Lord, to no longer go my own way but to follow you with my whole heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.